Welcome to YourCast, how to podcast brought to you by Blue Microphones. I'm David Savage, founder and editor of long-running technology podcast Tech Talks. I've published over 250 shows, reaching around 10,000 listeners a month on a minimal budget. And in this show, I talk to other showrunners and producers and find out how and why they put together the content that they do. It's recorded on the Blue Yeti X, anywhere and everywhere, as you'll discover through the series. And it's edited on free software. So listen to the show, and why not go and create your own content? Welcome to episode one, season one of a new show which we are putting out on the Tech Talks channel in association with Blue Microphones, the company who very kindly actually give the mics that Tech Talks is recorded on. I'm joined by my lovely wife Hayley. How are you? I'm doing great, thank you. Why, well, thank you for having me. <laughs> well, you're, you're very uh, kindly providing a foil for me because I'm useless at talking to a microphone on my own. This is very true. Yes, you are often telling me that I put pronunciation in all the wrong places, which is a useful actually, lesson for podcasters because um, incremental gains are, are what's what it's all about. And you have certainly helped me over the years <laughs> by pointing out my many faults. No! <laughs> um, look, so this show is all about the art of podcasting. If you are interested in running a podcast, if you're interested in knowing how those who do run podcasts went about starting one, well, we've, we're interviewing them and they're sharing those secrets with us. Um, so the first episode, we are very lucky to be joined by Dan murray Serta, who is one half of Secret Leaders. Have you heard of Secret Leaders? I have, yes. Yes. They have a few more downloads than Tech Talks do. Only a few, only a few. Is it, <laughs> is it a million, a few more? A what? million for the last series. Wow, yeah. fantastic. So the UK's number one business podcast, over a million downloads. They interview founders from businesses like Deliveroo, Slack, Babylon, Calm and Joe Malone. I know we have a Joe Malone candle, so I know who Joe Malone are. Yes. Um, I know who quite a few of their guests are because actually over the years we've, sh- we've shared the same guests. But not only do they talk to tech business founders but it's business founders of all sorts of all sorts yeah varieties yeah um they also yeah as you will see from the interview with dan were thrilled to become the number one overtaking tim ferris i kind of feel like it should be like a top of the pops moment it definitely should be yeah you should get a phone call from someone in the studio being like you've made it you've made it you're number one how do you feel where are you (laughs) (laughs) i seem to remember one with mika which must have been towards the end of when that was still quite cool and he was just in a pub Mika? Yeah, you know the... You uh, mean Grace Mika? Kelly. Yeah, that one. Grace Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know I loathe that song? I'm really sorry, but I absolutely loathe but that song. But I just song. remember it because he was just in a pub with his mates and just yeah, clearly they, they, wasn't ready for the phone call. They always were in random places. And what's really sad is that I used to tape the top 40 every Sunday. <laughs> I was there with my cassette and, you know, it would always run out. And you're like, damn it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think Dan had that experience. It might have just been refreshing, refreshing. Oh, hang on a minute. We've, we've, we're ahead of him. <laughs> yeah, it probably was more like that. But someone should look into this. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But look, it's a pretty good episode to start the season with. Uh, you're not going to get many bigger shows than Secret Leaders right now. So we'll hand over to the interview and find out exactly how they did it. So on today's episode, I'm joined by Dan murray Serta. Dan, you are one half of Secret Leaders, now the number one business podcast in the UK. Well done on that achievement. Thank you. I like to think that the I'm the, I'm the leader's half. Rich is the secret. Out of interest. I suppose, I suppose with Secret Leaders, it's a show that's been going for quite some time. How did it feel when you guys actually kind of got to that point where you, you could very openly say, hey, we're the number one, we've overtaken yeah. the BBC, uh, we've overtaken all these other shows that, to be perfectly honest, have that big media presence behind them? So it was, um, amazing, like, I distinctly remember, obviously, the, the fact that we got to number four Mm-hmm. And ahead of us was how I built this, the BBC and Tim Ferriss. And so I was like, oh, my God, you know, you could look at my Instagram um, for a timeline of how excited I was at the time, because I was like, the greatest achievement ever. We're at number four. I'm so proud we're here because that's nuts. And then about two days later, we were number two just behind Tim Ferriss. And I was like, there's absolutely no chance in hell of beating Tim Ferriss. But I'm so proud. And I my Instagram um pictures pretty much document exactly these words like the complete disbelief that i was even at number two with secret leaders and then when we actually beat tim ferris i don't even know why I, what i said because that was obviously not a um i guess not an expected 
realistic target. I think even getting to number two, like we always set out when we started, Secret Leaders were like, we want to be the best British podcast for businesses and entrepreneurship, full stop. Yeah. Um, that was like an initial target. But you know, you're meant to set a big, hairy, audacious goal on purpose um, to keep yourself motivated and going. But we run it as a nonprofit. We have put no money really into it other than literally buying our Yeti microphones and just starting off pretty cheap. Um, you know, there's been obviously a lot of progression through the series, etc. But you know, it's pretty cool for something that we just do as a side project. You set that um, objective for fun. You don't mm. really set it because you think that you can do it if you look at who the people are ahead of you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you started, had you had any previous experience of running podcasts? No, no. So the way we actually started it was, um, I was I was interviewing very. Uh, successful entrepreneurs about how they did it because the, basically they were investors in my company. Um, I was like, I'd love to get good at, at doing interviews. I think that'd be really interesting. So I was setting up events for entrepreneurs that had 30 to 40 people, really small events on purpose. Um, and the guests were able to sort of share how they felt about stuff. But, you know, when they were being honest, I was like, my God, I've just learned more in one hour than I've learned, you know, to be honest, over like three or four years of running a business. It's so valuable. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, Rich had actually just started doing a podcast with uh, another friend. Um, you know, they put a couple of them out and they hadn't really gone anywhere or done anything. And I, I just felt like the content wasn't very good, but the production was pretty decent. So I just went to Rich and I'm like, look, at the end of the day, like you're into um, producing a podcast. It's never something that I'm going to be into, like into doing as in the technical side of it, um, which is obviously increasingly less technical. But even at the time, you know, editing it and all that stuff was like, just not my bag. But like, I can definitely bring brilliant guests, research the best questions, get them to open up and be vulnerable. Like I'm already doing that stuff. And if you bring your podcast now, then we can bring this together and do it pretty easily without much stress. And that's exactly how we started. So I basically pitched him like doing my interview, so to speak, but just recorded as a podcast. So when we talk about a producer, because I'll be perfectly honest, when I came into podcasting, I was kind of a bit unsure what the role of a producer was. And if anyone's listening to it, you kind of say that some production work, he'd, he'd kind of started working on with a, with a friend on another podcast and it was some editing work and bits and pieces. What What is his role? Or well, sorry, what was his role then and how has it developed over time? Yeah, I think that's a good question. So, you know, at the time it was more like, you know, sourcing music and, um, you know, it's developed quite a lot. But at the time, like I said, sourcing music and a little bit of editing, um, mm. since since then, like now we've got a budget, we have an editor, we use a company called Lower Street, and they're brilliant. And they do all of our editing, they do our show notes, they make it a lot easier. And therefore, the role of the producer is less that but more actually spending more times on more time on editing. So we use a piece of software called Sonics, where it's basically transcribing. Um, and you know, that's picking out the best bits of the interview, making sure we know what we're going to use for trailers in next week, you know, giving like a call sheet on um, you know, all the little bits and pieces that sort of make up a podcast episode come together. So you can obviously put out one that is essentially just a straight conversation like this beginning to end. You don't yeah. need to really produce or edit that at all. But, you know, after the first series, I mean, the way that we actually went about it was the first series, we were like, let's just see how it goes. So it was very little going into it. I was just like, just, this was four years ago. So I don't think there even was syndication back then. So you did actually have to syndicate it onto, you know, Spotify and Apple yourself. I don't, in fact, we had to get onto Spotify separately. I don't think we even got first series onto Spotify. Um, and now, obviously, there's syndication platforms where you're just uploading the content and it goes across to all of them, which makes it a mm -hmm. lot easier. Um, so when the bar gets lowered in terms of the complexity and more people enter the market, your job as a, as a company or as a podcast producer or content producer is to figure out how to make your content just a little bit better every time. And so that's, I'd say, one of the key roles of him as a producer now is, you know, every series reflecting back and thinking, well, how can we make this a little bit better? And, you know, they include things like, um, you know, we've got a designer doing all of our artwork. You know, our artwork is really beautiful and very, very cool per episode. Um, and it's little things like that that get you stand, help you stand out. So, you know, our episode last week was on Kids at Home with uh, two amazing founders of uh, businesses that serve parents and, and and they've got kids themselves and they're running businesses themselves. 
And our artwork was so beautiful. It got featured, I mean, it's still there right now. Like it's featured on the Apple, on the iTunes homepage right at the top, like the big, big banner right at the top. Because it's just really, really cool, unique artwork that's quite fun. Um, so, you know, we've, we've taken different attitudes every series of, you know, well, how could we improve this a little bit, this series or next series? And that's really the job of the producer to lead. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I, as the host, I've also got quite a lot of uh, opinions on what good sounds like. Just out of interest, um, we were chatting before we hit record about the fact that you could now start integrating video into some of your podcasts. And obviously, you're talking about incremental changes and differences and how you can how you can build and keep progressing. Why podcasting as a medium? Well, why do you think podcasting as a medium is the right kind of medium and channel for what you're trying to achieve? And does video add anything to it? I mean, I've always had this sneaking suspicion that as soon as you ask someone to face up to camera that they get that little bit more nervous. And, and you said right at the beginning there that one of the brilliant things about those those talks that you were doing was that you learned more in an hour than you had done in, in years of working. And I suppose anything that stops someone opening up and sharing is is actually counter counterintuitive to what you're trying to do. Yeah, I think you're completely spot on. So, um, you know, there's a load of reasons. And, you know, I fall into the bracket you just said. So, you know, one of my big um new year's resolutions last year 2019 was uh, to get over my fear of video like i i like everyone had you know a, i didn't like the sound of my own voice so how did i get over that fear i started a podcast that's actually one of the reasons why i wanted to start a podcast because you need to get over your own insecurities and every human has them right so i am as insecure about the sound of my own voice as i am how i look and behave on video so the start of 2019 you know that was my thing i'm going to start doing a video on youtube sorry on, on instagram every single week um for my newsletter so that so i send a newsletter on brain health for my company heights i'm like that'll be a really good way to present it you know i got about seven or eight months in until i just was like oh, i can't even bother to do this anymore i just you know and I've, I've, I've personally fallen away from doing it again and i'm trying to get back into doing it again and um, one of the insights i've got, uh, gathered during COVID and during the quarantine is the usual way that people find podcasts is different right now right so ultimately um, the time spent podcasting is usually commuting, as we know, the commuting audience is gone. So you kind of need to be finding a way to help people carve those moments out. And the reason why I've actually just started doing video for our podcast isn't so we can use the whole video, because I still agree with you. I don't think it's particularly interesting to see our two faces like this. It's actually for a social trailer. So time on social has gone up. And discovery, ultimately, people are spending so much time on social media anyway. So we need like a new trigger that's engaging and makes sense. So actually, it's more about capturing the moment of the really interesting insight, the, the sound bite that someone says, and using that as a social trailer. Um, and obviously, getting approval from the guests first. So being like, look, you said, you know, the Rachel Carroll one in our Kids at Home one was uh, fuck growth. Like, there's no point about, you know, doing growth. Oh, sorry, I probably shouldn't swear on this one, should I? Uh, no, no, no I, I think it's fine. Okay, it's one um, of the nice things about podcasts, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyway, but that, you know, that's what she said. And she was like, you know, investors just won't care right now, and it makes her feel brilliant. But it's just a really mm. great soundbite. We also went to her and said, you know, can we use this? But it, it, you know what I mean. Like if I was, I always think about things how I would behave if I was scrolling on social and I saw some, an entrepreneur who's really well respected saying something like that. I want to hear the rest of what that person's got to say. Yeah. And it's a different way of experiencing the way into a podcast at the moment. I think people are going to need a lot more triggers. So your podcast was that kind of confluence of a, a bit of professional interest, a little bit of passion, and also a little bit of wanting to uh, to grow personally in, in terms of expanding some of your skill sets. But that's a long way from where you are now, sitting here four years on with a lot of understanding about what works and what doesn't work. So in the early days, where did you go for help and advice? That's a very good question. Uh, to be totally frank, we didn't seek out. Um, I don't I think there was a lot of help or advice out four years ago. But at the same time, I don't really, um, I don't think we tried too much. And that's actually, that was a bit of a detriment. So I listened back to my first series. Um, I find myself very embarrassing because, you know, I interrupt all the time. You know, I wanted the skill of of getting over hearing myself talking. But actually, you know, the skill that I didn't expect to develop that I really did was learning to be a better interviewer, which is you're doing right now, you know, is asking a question, let the person ramble. The guest is the person in the spotlight, not the interviewer. And a great interviewer spends very little time talking if they've asked the right questions. And that's something that took me 
embarrassingly, you know, 15 whole episodes in the first series to realize because we weren't going and getting enough feedback. So funny enough, like our feedback loop was literally learning it ourselves by by doing and by failing and then by being really critical with each other. So Rich and I have a very good relationship because we're very different. Uh, we're very different approaches. I've got no interest in doing what he does. He's got no interest in doing what I do. And um, we're both very blunt with each other. And that, cre- that keeps the growth uh, engine really, really healthy. Um, I come up with loads of ideas and Rich is very good at saying no. And that's really helpful. Rich doesn't really come up with any ideas. But at the same time, like if we did all of mine, it would be a messy piece of crap. Right. So the ability to like be really clear and focused again, job of a producer, like what do the audience want um, is trying to like make sure that, you know, we're listening to feedback from people and then improving the podcast simply by uh, paying attention and shutting up a lot of the time. One thing I find really interesting, um, and this I don't know whether this came from your audience, I, I suspect not, but um, is around the difference between needing to, to, to or how you build that consistency. So do you go for kind of continuous, we're going to, pr- we're going to put a show out every single week, or we're going to have seasons? And by the sounds of it, seasons was a format that you came to prior to getting some of that feedback. It was just something that you went with, but it seems to have worked. Yes. Um, how how do you balance that consistency wanting to be in there wanting to build that audience and also obviously you sometimes take a break yeah i think it's a really good question uh the way that we started was under this theory so we had this concept that we want to be quality not quantity and if we want secret leaders to be a place where you come for really like outstanding interviews with brilliant people that you just don't often hear then less is more because if you're committing to every single week, you know, I love Tim Ferriss, obviously, but like, you know, half of his interviews are awful. They're just boring and rubbish. And of course, like there's only so many brilliantly interesting people in the world and there's only so many brilliant questions that you can ask them and get decent answers from. So we had this kind of approach that uh, there aren't that many really interesting and also vulnerable people willing to talk about what was hard and what went wrong and how they did it on a podcast. So that kind of dictated our strategy of saying 15 a year. The other side to it is that we're both full-time entrepreneurs. So we have no intention of making money out of doing our podcast. We always decided from day one that it was going to be like just for love and, uh, and just for fun. And so to do that, you kind of need to commit to it not taking over your life. Um, there's a very structured way that we've done secret leaders every time that, you know, it's worth me saying, you know, I, I, you know, running a startup, um, things are very busy all the time. There's loads of meetings, you're doing funding, etc. And then you're trying to meet someone else like that in an interview room. You know, it's, it's impossible scheduling a normal coffee with an entrepreneur, let alone an interview. So the amount of times you have to change the date and shift it up, etc. It's really stressful. So to us, we're like, we will record these like three or four months before they go out, like a whole series. And that will give us a bunch of time in advance to edit them, put them out, not be stressed. If, if a guest needs to reschedule the interview like 15 times, let them reschedule it 15 times. We've had about three guests that ended up going in the next series. There was so much rescheduling. But the point is, you didn't have to be like, no, mate, it's now or never. Um, so that stuff has been really helpful for us. Now, the flip side is, we were actually meant to do series five in um, September uh, and we'd lined up some awesome guests for stories, like really, really cool guests. And you know, like when I say that we have fantastic guests like founders of Slack and Deliveroo, et cetera. So, you know, really going for the top draw. And the reality is COVID hit. Um, we decided it's far more useful and far more practical for our audience to basically break our own tradition and be like, that's not really what people want right now. Like what what bi- people in businesses and startups right now, what they need is some guidance and some help and some, you know, empathy. So people that are going through it right now, what are the steps they're taking and how are they doing it? And so that's kind of where we just came up with this on the fly concept for this series, which is a pandemic special, basically. And we're trying to mix it up. So we had our first episode was Ali Parsa, the founder of Babylon Health, which is the biggest healthcare app in the world. Um, but with Dr. Rongan Chatterjee, who's one of the best known healthcare um, practitioners in the UK. So a really different um, attitude. The conversation was really quite amazing. Um, the second episode that we had was this Kids at Home. 
Um, so with Rachel Carroll and Bethany Kobe um, talking about literally what it's like running a business and the day school programming, but also their, their whole audience is that. Our episode next week's on productivity with the founder of Slack. So again, it's really interesting talking about how they've grown um, exponentially throughout this process, but also lost a load of customers because all their businesses are furloughing people. So it was a really interesting scaling issue from a productivity software company. And the week after that's on mental health with the founder of Calm and the author of Lost Connections, Johan Hari. So we're trying to like mix up these conversations and make them you know, both business and society focused. So we kind of get both sides of the conversation. You're calling that secret leaders in crisis, right? Yeah, that's right. Times of crisis. Yeah. Um, no. And, you know, it's still, still intended to be a limited series. And we're putting out an extra one on Sundays, which, like I said, is just the lowdown of the news. So that's more like 15 to 20 minute episodes with some special guests. Like today we had Martha Lane Fox and Mike Butcher. Um, we have the enterprise editor of The Times next week. So it's trying to, like, m- you know, make sure we're getting credible experts in, not just some random opinion of two podcasters that, frankly, don't know any more than the actual journalist spending time on it. Oh, they can come over to our show for that. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, this is the thing. So we're trying to adapt. Um, and I yeah. think it's really important because, you know, right now in podcast land, people do need to adapt. And mm. my behavior to anything that happens like this pandemic is there's two approaches you can take. One, you can wait for the new normal um, to just like come back um, and for things to pre- like to resume as they were. Or two, you can just get on with it and accept that however long this goes on for is not really for you or I to call. We have no idea. So we might as well just get really comfortable with a new way of living super fast and everything from there is upside. Now, look, the the current circumstances are kind of forcing people's hands around how they record their podcasts, etc. But in normal times, you mentioned Interview Room. Uh, The interview that you conducted with Delivery was certainly in a studio in Soho. Um, Some of those ideas or sorry some of those situations might sound expensive to people and put them off the idea of podcasting but i I suppose i've always been keen to get across to people that the podcasting can be very fluid and flexible how how did you start recording because i'm assuming you didn't have any of those usual things to begin with no totally so i mean in the show notes i'd love you to share an article i wrote which is literally uh from day one to now to basically last week's episode because we update it uh, you know, how you took, uh, you know, a podcast from two Yeti microphones to Britain's number one. And that is essentially something, you know, if you go on secretleaders.com, there's a free download PDF and we transparently say everything links even to the Yeti microphones we used at the time with the photos of us doing it and how badly I was doing it. There's a photo where I'm actually pointing out in the article, I'm here and there's two guests and the Yeti microphone is just in the middle. And I'm like, that's not how you record a good interview. But, you know, at the time we had one one mic. So you learn these things. And, um, you know, the truth of the matter is it's all been a, a process, right? So we've just chosen to improve things a little bit, bit by bit. And um, the normal way that we set out was just it, we booked meeting rooms and we put a microphone, at, you know, literally a Yeti in front of the guest and we just interviewed. It just doesn't need to be, uh, you know, a really great production. In fact, this is... Absolutely. Right now, this is exactly what people are expecting. Hmm. And that's, you know, I, I honestly see this as a massive opportunity, um, you know, in terms of what you're always trying to do is match a customer's expectations. Well, expectations just fell through the floor. So doing them recorded like we are on Squadcast, you know, away from each other, not in the same room with the same kind of chemistry you get from that, not in a soundproofed environment. doesn't matter. It's not what people are listening in for at the moment. And look, just one last thing I'd, I'd like to ask you before we go on to some some quick fire questions. Mm. And you kind of alluded to this earlier by talking about what stops you uh, from scrolling on social media. But of the content that you do listen to, what is it about that content that really engages you? So uh, to be honest with you, I like expertise from the host. Um, uh, yeah, it's actually interesting. I say that I like expertise from the host or expertise from the guest. Uh, guest sometimes doesn't really work when they both have loads of expertise. So interviews, I mean, I always, obviously, I do like how I built this. Obviously, I appreciate that we're like direct competitor. My issue with how I built this in general is I feel like he lets a lot of his guests get out of jail free. Um, you know, he doesn't really ask hard questions and if they don't want to answer it, he doesn't really push them, which I always make sure I do do. 
Um, but, you know, he gets really interesting guests and I really enjoy that. I listen to quite a lot of science podcasts. So, I mean, I'm a really big fan of anything that Gimlet create, of course, like the production quality is so high and so quirky and they do make a good effort to make it fun. And then, um, you know, to be honest, my wife listens to so many crime podcasts it's really interesting. She just listens to crime and there's, you know, those are like stories retold, so to speak. Whereas what I tend to listen to, like I say, is just, you know, mostly uh, stuff about science and wellness and they tend to be interviews. So, you know, the good ones will have little jingles and little fun bits, but, you know, they don't, they don't really need to. You just want someone, one of the two people in the interview to have some kind of expertise I can learn something new from. Amazing. Well, look, um, it's really interesting to get your insights. I'm sure it's hugely valuable given the success of Secret Leaders. So thank you for uh, just My talking pleasure. about some points there. Before we let you go, <clears throat> you mentioned a few podcasts there, putting you on the spot, not Secret Leaders. You can't pick your own podcast. What What would you say your favorite podcast is? Um, I think my favorite podcast, certainly my favorite podcast at the moment um, is Science Versus, which is a, uh, a Gimlet Media podcast. Mm-hmm. It's just really fun. I learn a lot. They're only 20 to 25 minutes, which is perfect. Um, and they're always very quirky. I also have to say, I just recently listened to We Crashed, the We Work one, which I thought was really good fun, very entertaining. You know, everyone likes a limited series that you can just listen to once and forget. Um, to the same note, I absolutely loved the one with... Um, oh, God, what's her name? I've read it literally three times. The Bad Blood... Um, yeah, Elizabeth Holmes, you know, the podcast on that was really, really well done, but you know, I'd already read the book, so it's kind of the same thing over and over again, but are you, you know, a well-crafted story led one-off podcast series, you know, you can't beat, but on an ongoing basis, it's, it's science versus for me. How long on average do you listen to a show? I've actually got a lot of patience for it. It depends what I'm doing. Like I love, like I walk everywhere. I obviously can't do that at the moment, but, um, I'll usually spend about two hours a day walking. And so I'm more than happy to listen to podcasts that are an hour, hour and a half long. Um, and so, you know, for those, I'm happy to listen to a Joe Rogan or a Tim Ferriss or any of the long ones. That's fine. Um, you know, I like Dr. Rung and Chatterjee as well. Um, I don't really listen to many comedy podcasts or silly podcasts. Oh, and I tell you what I just listened to that I loved, but I was mostly just doing preparation because uh, I'm interviewing him in two weeks was Stephen Fry's Seven Deadly Sins. Um, that's good fun. He's just amazing at narrating. So just listening to him on audio is so oh. entertaining. I, that, the, the, the success of the Harry Potter, Harry Potter audio Potter, yeah. has to be down to how brilliant he is. I know. Um, I do agree. You've just mentioned there that you like to listen whilst walking, but if you had to pick a favourite time or place, is, is it whilst walking or are there any other places that you kind of really find yourself losing yourself in a, in a podcast? So it, look, it generally is walking, but like, for example, yesterday was just, you know, cleaning the house day. So me and my wife spent four or five hours cleaning. So I listened to like hours and hours of podcasts then. And that's kind of what I try and do. I try and find something that I can do and uh, match it with because that's essentially habit stacking. So the other one would be cooking. If I'm not really desperately like learning how to cook something new, where I need full focus, then listening to a podcast whilst I cook is perfect. And those are kind of the ways I'm making sure I'm still learning whilst I'm in quarantine. Um, you've had some amazing guests on the show. You're talking there about interviewing Stephen Fry in a couple of weeks. But if, if, if you had a complete um, carte blanche to, to pick anybody, who would you wish to interview? This is a very good question. Um, I think the most interesting person in the world to interview right now has probably got to be Bill Gates. Um, yeah. He's just doing such incredible work. And, you know, he is someone who was, it's just fascinating. He just was an asshole for the first half of his life and is like the complete antithesis of that, the second half. Um, I think he's just a really great example of, um, how people should, I mean, shouldn't behave uh, whilst getting rich and successful with the anti-competitive stuff, et cetera, and then absolutely how they should behave and why in some respects, you know, ultra wealth and capitalism in that sense is great because who would you rather spend all that kind of money, him or Donald Trump? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm assuming you've seen Bill's Brain on Netflix. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, and lastly, look, bit of bit of silliness, but if you had an unlimited pot of money and very little concern over the consequences what would you do with it 
I think I would probably buy a lovely big commune type house that like in a big plot of land that I could have like four or five of my best friend couples living there as well, where you're all just massive piece of land, but you kind of all live together, but you don't. And my mum as well, but you know, far, far enough away, there's not a problem, but you know, the pandemic's so interesting because it's made me think about, you know, social distancing in another way. And, you know, there's just a bunch of my people that I would love to see all the time. So and you're then, a braver man than me, I think, involving parents. <laughs> I know, I know. I just feel so guilty because I've not seen, like, you know what I mean? My mum's just on her own. I'm like, it, what would I do with all that money? Well, I'd probably try and put myself in a position where I could see her. Um, well, look, but yeah. Look, Dan, thank you very much for spending some time with us. Uh, you did mention that you have a, a podcasting guide. That's secretleaders.com forward slash ultimate dash podcast dash guide well worth a look if anyone is interested but um it is sunday evening so i'll let you get back to your evening thanks for your time thank you david